Good morning. Y'all are unusually quiet this morning. No, no. Good morning. Those of you that are watching us live, good morning to you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let us get ready to worship. And uh, we're going to start out this morning with our Advent reading and prayer. The third Sunday of Advent readings is joy. Matthew 2, 10 and 11. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. When they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Bow our heads pray. Father, thank you for this time of fellowship, Father. Thank you for the breath you breathe in us. Thank you for the joy that you bring us when we wake up, Father. Thank you for the joy that explodes inside each and every one of us to reflect you, Father. Father, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Gina and Pastor Mario today, Father, and that you're here in our presence, Father, that you lift our spirits up, Father, that we just feel you in our praise and our worship, Father, and that we receive your message for our spirits, Father. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together now.
gives us gives us so many lessons and some we you know you can read a story one one time in the Bible and, and the Lord teaches you something and you read it again and he teaches us something maybe di not different but in a different direction and um, I was struck this week um, by a thought about the manger scene and um, I was looking through uh, a website that I use a lot under Christmas songs, and one of the ones they were, they recommended was a, room, uh, uh, a a song called "Make Room," and we sang this recently. And it's, the chorus goes, "I will make room for you to do whatever you want to." And I thought about that in, in the story of the manger scene, how Mary and Joseph sought for a place to to stay, and yet the innkeeper said, "There's no room for them." And I, and I thought about that in, in the light of our own lives during these Christmas seasons, these times when uh, we've got so much going on with parties and gifts and everything else that's going on. And I think that the silent message that, or the quiet message that Jesus gives us here is, is he wants us to make room for him because this is about him. Amen. And, and I pray in all your hustle and bustle, <laughs> And all that's going on, I don't know about you, but my schedule is crazy the next couple of weeks. And uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I just need to pause and say, Jesus, ooh, this is not about us, it's about you. Amen. I make room in my heart for you. In fact, I clear out all sorts of stuff out of me to make more room for you. As we sing this, I pray that you will yield to this message and to this word that Jesus gives us. I think there was a real reason that he went to this end and there was no room. I think he wanted, he wanted that to happen. God wanted that to happen to teach us this lesson and this message.
time and uh, there was a table that was seated next to us and they were there for a few second, uh, minutes probably and, and the waiter came and said, what can I get you to drink? And they said, we'll have what they're having. <laughs> Only problem was all we had was water and tea. <laughs> but they wanted what we had, whatever they, they thought it was some something from the bar. Well, I'm gonna tell you that the joy of the Lord can be a more normative experience for the believer. And it'll keep people wondering, you know. Uh, uh, when I was uh, back in my, uh, I don't know, these were interesting days, I was traveling back and forth to Mexico, and I was uh, bringing back over from Mexico uh, big suitcases, 50 kilos of uh, <laughs> silver jewelry. I was going to buy uh, silver down by the silver mines. And, uh, boy, some of y'all. Schmancy metal detector. And uh, we took it out there in the mountains, had to ride the little burros. The little burros. My friend was a little smaller and lighter than I was, and he got two burros about the same um, size. And when I got on my burro, <laughs> it literally went. <laughs> <laughs> his heart. <laughs> and we went all up. He, did, he said, we're going to go up into the mountains where the little villagers have been digging in and around in the dirt and in the mountains to look for silver and for gold. And we took it and you had to, you know, wear uh, headphones and it had this little readout and it was real fancy and it could, it could detect uh, different sources of uh, metal depending on the frequencies that were registering. It would also tell you the depth, how far down uh, that that particular thing was. And I used to use it uh, back here just to go near the lake or in the park and find gold coins or quarters or sometimes you find a ring or uh, some piece of jewelry and, and you end up paying for your metal detector. But we would go and we would look and we would search and we would make an effort and we had to listen and we had to pay attention. I think finding joy is a whole lot better to find than any precious metal, any gold, any silver, anything that you and I would deem as something that we could give our time to and our effort. Finding joy is a great thing. And this morning, I want to encourage us to uh, look at this idea of finding joy in our lives. I want us to see the source of our joy and then the secret of finding joy. The source of finding joy, we understand, if you remember in Galatians 5, that it is one of the fruit of the Spirit. 
It is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Joy. Ultimately, our source is the Holy Spirit. And those of us who claim to have the Holy Spirit working and operating in our lives can have joy as a distinctive. And it, it ought to be something that is characteristic of how we walk. But there's also a secret in finding joy. And it speaks to the fact that in James 1 and 2, uh, James writes this. He says, uh, brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials and temptations. Wait a minute. How, how can falling into difficult times be a source of joy? And yet the scripture is very clear. He says, count it all joy. That word count means to systematically scrutinize. Systematically scrutinize. It kind of is reminiscent of that old hymn that some of you may grow up singing. Count too many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Anybody ever sing that hymn? Count your blessings. It's, it's, it's a great, it's a great old hymn. But James says that one of the secrets to finding joy in our lives is to sit down and systematically look at the things that are happening in our lives and find a way to have joy in the midst of that. Oh, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. Uh, the only way that we can find this joy, which is a joy that is contented and satisfied, contented and satisfied, the only way we can do this is to understand the fact that God is working. God is working. Friends, when we go through difficult times, God is trying to do something. He's trying to get our attention. He's trying to uh, maybe take that clay that is needing it, uh, to be molded and shaped in a certain way. And he's applying pressure to get a certain result. And so we can count it all joy. So here is the dichotomy of joy. The fact that. Our source is found in the Holy Spirit, in God. That's our ultimate source. But there's also man's particular and woman's particular effort in the whole thing, and that's to count it as joy, to systematically list that. And I, I, I want to just pause for a second and just say this. Do you understand that the larger context of living the Christian life the larger context of living the Christian life is that we have an opportunity to partner with God. Imagine those of you who are in business or have thought about being in business or used to be in business. Imagine, if you would, that uh, you received an inquiry and, and uh, someone says to you, I want to be your partner in your business. And then you begin to ask a series of questions. Well, uh, do you have the wherewithal to do that? I mean, I, I, I do pretty well. And I mean, I need a partner that's going to be, you know, substantial in the, the financial area. Have you got resources for that? Financial resources. And comes the answer, I have unlimited resources. Well, do you have any experience? Oh, yes, I, I have a, a limitless amount of experience. Well, how about wisdom in all of this? Oh, no, it's, it's beyond in any of your comprehension how much wisdom and experience and resources and finances that I have. Well, I would think if you're an astute business person, you would say, well, let's get together and have coffee and let's... Uh, Let's hammer out a thing. Now, what, now what, what, is, 
What is it that you're looking for from me? Well, all I want from you is you. All I want from you is you. I just want to partner with you. Listen, friends, the great context, the great amazing thing about the gospel of Christ is that Christ sought in a very real and tangible way a partnership with man and woman. A partnership that would say the vast resources of heaven, the power, the wisdom, the strength, the, the, the knowledge, the experience, all of that I want to make available to you if you'll partner with me and your job is to just come alongside and watch me do what I do. And so we have this, this invitation to partner with the Lord. And it is no less important in this understanding of joy. The fact that here God is saying, I have all these fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, all the whole nine fruit of the Spirit. And all you have to do is yield to my Spirit's work in your life and find a place of contentment in your life and satisfaction in your life and understand that when you're going through a difficult time you can find joy and you can choose that wonderful secret of contentment in your life but i have discovered something about joy and i want to say just a few things about this joy first of all i found that sometimes joy is preceded by a season of waiting. A season of waiting. Oh, don't you just love to wait? I just, I mean, I'm just I'm so excited to wait. You know, I, I don't know what the big draw is with the uh, Dutch Brothers coffee, but there's a lot of people waiting for some Dutch Brothers coffee. And one of these days, if the line is ever not around the block, I'm going to stop and maybe get a cup. When one of them opened up near our house, they literally had the police out there monitoring the flow of the traffic because there were so many cars lined up at Dutch Brothers Coffee. And, and if you uh, own a Dutch Brothers Coffee franchise, uh, let me give you the church's address you can, uh, for this free endorsement. Uh, you can send a gift card. Um, yeah. But sometimes joy is preceded by a season of waiting. Oh, we just have to wait. I mean, look how, look, look at the garden, for instance. Here, Adam and Eve sin, and the relationship with God is broken. Well, if ultimately the goal of salvation was just to reinstitute that relationship, then Christ could have died in that moment. Christ could have died within their lifetime if, that's the, if that was just the one goal. Okay, Adam and Eve are lost. Jesus, we need your sacrifice for their sin. But no, it, it, didn't, it didn't happen at the time that they sinned. Oh, we had to wait. We had to go through, uh, through Abraham and all those years and, and the years of Moses and, 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 then, and, and King David and all the kingdoms and and, and these thousands of years go by and we're still waiting on the Son of God to come. There was a, what is called an intertestamental time frame. When you look at the Old Testament in your Bible and the New Testament in your Bible, there was a period of about 400 years where seemingly there was nothing going on. Seemingly, God was silent. But you remember, 
that one of the ways we find joy is to understand that God is working even when you don't see it. Oh, you and I are so human in our uh, nature to want to see God do something that is uh, tangible and visible in the moment. I can see it right now, today, this minute. Lord, send it now. Not understanding that God is doing something. God is at work. And he was at work during these 400 years from Malachi to John the Baptist. Chris, is it just me or every time I look at Malachi, I want to say mariachi. That's <laughs> <laughs> just me. Yeah. I literally almost said from mariachi to John the Baptist. But Malachi, the last prophet, had spoken and given those beautiful prophecies. And it's not until 400 years later that John the Baptist comes and says, prepare the way of the Lord. 400 years. Well, during that time, there were at least six governmental transitions in the life of the nation of Israel. Six governmental transitions from the Persian Empire to the Greek Empire, the Egyptians, the Syrians, the Maccabean uh, uh, dynasty, and then the Roman Empire. Six governmental transitions in the life of the nation of Israel and finally got to the Roman time. And according to Galatians 4, the beginning of verse 4, it says, but when the right time came, God sent his son Maybe you memorize it in the King James, when the fullness of time had come. When the fullness of time had come. See, there was a there was a waiting. Sometimes joy, we just have to go through a season of waiting. And I don't like it. I don't like to wait. It's not my favorite thing. Uh, I remember when we were transitioning from the government of Texas to the government of New Mexico. And I had to give up my Texas driver's license for my New Mexico driver's license. My Texas tags for the New Mexico tags, which I think is pretty weird. They got, well, I won't say. They're real pretty. And so I had to go down. Now, I'm, here we are right in the thick of the Navajo Nation. And uh, so I go to the MVD, and I sit there, I take a number. And uh, it's a very large room, and it's filled with predominantly uh, our Navajo friends there. And uh, if you were to see a lot of Navajo together and put me in the middle, you would think I was Navajo. I love Navajo. Uh, many times they would begin to talk to me in, in their uh, Diné language. Translates is how's it going, man? Uh, and so we were there, and, and we're waiting, and we're waiting, and it's like migration. And I mean, you know, I'm like number 98, and they're like number seven, please. <laughs> number seven, come to Earth Window. I was there, it was hours, it was hours. I finally got up to, to my window. I gave him the papers, I gave him the money, and they handed me the tags, and, 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 and uh, it was such a glorious moment. I was overcome with joy, because I had waited. And I turned, and, and here I am at the window, and I turned to all of the Navajo there in the room. And I went, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Now, the Navajo are generally very reserved. <laughs> They're looking at me, and I just kept singing. And finally, one of them was 
<laughs> and then they, they finally broke out into a laugh. I hated waiting for that, but joy finally came, the joy of becoming an official New Mexican. But not only did it go through six, during this 400 year intertestamental period, this period of waiting, uh, when Rome finally hit the scene, there was a thing called the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana, which is the, the peace of Rome. Rome had so conquered and subjugated their, uh, the, the nations around them that there was an aura of peace. There was a semblance of everything is, the, the wars are over, everything is great. I mean, this is, this is a good time to be alive. But also during that time, uh, the lingua franca of the, of the empire became Koine Greek. It's critical. The common language among all the merchants and in the streets and the, among the peoples of various ethnicities and, and various countries and, and their native tongues, what they did was they also learned and spoke and became the predominant language was this Koine Greek of which the New Testament was written in. All of this is getting set up during this period of inactivity, if you will. Also during that time, the Old Testament, the Septuagint, was translated into Greek, which would have been critical when the New Testament was being written because the, the, the authors were pulling from the scriptures and they could pull right out from the Greek. The Roman road system, the Via Romane, the Roman road system, the highway system, was being extended all over the empire so that when the gospel came on the day of Pentecost and people were changed, they had come from every nation, they could go back to their nations and spread the gospel that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God, and the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is being given and poured out among people. It was also a time during this intertestamental period when the pagan gods of the Greeks and the Romans kind of began to wane in popularity, and they were just like, they, they weren't doing it anymore for the people. They were, they were worshiping, but nothing was happening. So there was, uh, there was a dearth of quality uh, the spiritual uh, vitality among the people. They were hungry and thirsty for a move of the true God. Also, the Jews began to uh, think about, boy, wouldn't this be a great time for Messiah to come? Wouldn't this just be wonderful? Listen, all that happened during that 400-year period of waiting. Friends, listen, if you're in a period of waiting right now and you're not experiencing much joy, you and I need to understand that God is at work and God is engineering things in our lives that when the time comes, when the fullness of time comes, joy will come flooding into our lives. We'll begin to see that which he is been doing all along. So sometimes joy is preceded by a season of waiting, but sometimes joy is preceded, preceded by a season of weeping. Season of weeping. I think of the psalmist in Psalm 30, verses 4 and 5. It says, Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment. But his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. If you're in a nighttime season in your life, and there's not uh, there's not a lot of uh, light on the situation in your heart and in your soul. You know, the theologians speak of, and some of the great mystics, Christian mystics, talk about the dark night of the soul. That in every 
Christian pilgrimage, you and I are going to go through some times where there is a dark night of the soul. Now, I don't know about you, um, but I have had those sleepless nights where I've been struggling with things, where I've been fighting fear, I've been fighting frustration, I've been fighting anxiety and stress, and I can't sleep, and I get up and I go and I sit in in the quiet and the darkness of the living room there, and I just, I'm just there, and it's dark, and I'm working through things, and my mind is racing, and I'm concerned about it all, and I'm, I'm finding myself in this dark night of the soul where I'm just battling. Uh, we went through a situation with my son uh, where he had always had kind of an unusual growth on his chest near his heart. And uh, I noticed as he was getting older that it was becoming more pronounced. And I got really concerned. And I'm praying because I'm sitting there going, Lord, you know <laughs> that right now in my self-employed status as a home painter, and a part-time song leader, I don't have any insurance. Lord, you're my insurance. Yeah. And I'm really concerned, Lord, that this growth near his heart and on his chest is really something bad. Man, I was so filled with fear. I was so frustrated because I didn't have the money to, to, to see to that. And so, thank you, Jesus, for the United Methodist Church, after two years of serving in the United Methodist Church, they granted me a license to preach. They sent me to school. They bought my book. They paid for my gas. They bought me a dorm uh, meal pass. Thank you, Jesus. Nothing like dorm food. But, um, <laughs> And they did something else. They got us on health insurance. The great ministry. And so, as first first chance we got, we took that boy down to the doctor, and we said we need to find out what's going on with his chest and his throat. I mean, I've had enough nights, dark nights, nights where I'm weeping. Lord, please don't let this be something horrible. And we, we took him in, and the doctor did x-rays and looked at everything, and he said, well, I don't know how to tell you all this, but uh, when your son was in the oven baking, uh, there was a little extra layer of skin, and a, a little extra layer of muscle and tissue that just laid on thick in that area. And there's nothing wrong with your son. He doesn't have any kind of a heart condition to him or nothing. It, it's just an extra layer of muscle and tissue. Oh, thank you, Jesus. The joy, the joy that came after weeping through the night and the dark night of the soul. Sometimes joy is preceded by a season of weeping. But like San Juan de la Cruz, he decided to choose joy in his life, and in one of the lines of his poem, he wrote this, My house being now at rest. My house being now at rest. Oh, this house found rest Amen. in the, the coming joy. Amen. So sometimes joy is preceded by waiting. Sometimes it's preceded by weeping. But sometimes joy is ushered in by proclamation. It's ushered in by proclamation. Listen to what the angel said in Luke 2, 8 through 14. It's a familiar story. You'll recognize it. It's part of our Christmas tradition. That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. 
They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. The angel said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Hallelujah! The thousands of years all the way back from the garden to the birth of Christ, the joy of the Lord has finally been made known to the earth, and the earth can have joy if it wants it. If they'll accept the Savior, if they'll accept Jesus Christ. You know, everybody needs Jesus. Everybody needs Jesus. And this joy is available to all through Jesus Christ. Joy is not something that is, uh, that God is sitting there uh, jealously and zealously guarding and safeguarding and saying, uh, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I want to give them any joy. You know, I just let, let me think about it. No, the angel said it will bring great joy to all people. The joy of the Lord is available to all. So why? I don't understand why it is my inclination, or maybe a couple of years' inclination, to want to withhold that joy from anyone. Yeah. Why? Why would we not want others to experience the joy that we have found? Yes, yes, yes. It ought to be a great motivator. And in this case, this is a proclamation coming from the throne of heaven, from the angels in heaven. They're proclaiming joy. Sometimes joy is ushered in by proclamation, but sometimes it's also ushered in by praise. Now the Lord snuck in Psalm 71 last uh, week on me as I was studying this. I, I, I didn't, I, how did Psalm 71 show up in there? I don't know, I just, but I, I, I got to reading this, and, and I've read it before, but you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you read something and it's kind of like, whoa, I didn't see that before. And that's what I'm talking about. Psalm 71, beginning in verse 17 through 24. Listen to, listen to this. And uh, I'm not sure I like Ed Cantor, and I'm not sure I like this New Living Translation. And I'll tell you why when I get to this part that I'm going to read. Verse 17 of Psalm 71, it begins this way. O oh God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O oh God. I don't like that version. <laughs> so I'm going to read that phrase from the New American Standard Version. And it says, O oh God, you taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. And even when I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O oh God. I like that better. Because that's a future event, amen? Or the future event. And even when I'm old and gray. Not right now. I'm not old and gray right now. Uh-uh. Way out yonder. And it says this. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation. Your mighty miracles to all who come after me. Your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the highest heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O oh God? You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort me once again. Then I will praise you with music on the harp. Because you are faithful to your promises, O oh my God. 
I will sing praises to you with a lyre. That's not L-I-A-R, that's L-Y-R-E. <laughs> o Holy One of Israel, verse 23. I will shout for joy and sing your praises. For you have ransomed me. I will tell about your righteous deeds all day long. For everyone who tried to hurt me has been shamed and humiliated. Friends, let me tell you something. There is a joy that sometimes is ushered in by when we just praise him. Yeah. We just praise him. Yeah. The psalmist said, I will shout for joy. I will sing your praise. I, I don't know about you, but this life is sufficient enough to steal all of our songs. Mm -hmm. yeah. To cause us to just kind of uh, keep our mouths shut and be more morose and more somber and more pensive. But we can, as a matter of will, usher in joy just by, if nothing else, just stand and decree and proclaim I have the joy of the Lord. I mean, I feel like I'm not. I may be going through some junk. I may be tired. I, I, I may, I may, I may have not got everything I need right now. But I am going to stand in the strength of the Lord, and I'm going to proclaim His joy in my life. And as a result of that, I'm going to obediently begin to just praise Him. Just praise Him. Praise Him. Lord, praise I praise you, Lord, that you got me up this morning. I praise you, Lord, that you're providing for all my needs. I praise you, Lord, that I haven't missed a meal in such a long time I don't even remember when. Uh, Lord, I praise you that when I put the key in this morning, the car started. Hallelujah. I praise you, Lord, that when it broke down last week, you provided the money to pay the mechanic. Lord, I praise you for the clothes that I have on. That they're, that they're new, that I got Chinese juice. I got Chinese juice. What I do. I got shoes on my feet. And I just start praising it as a matter of your will. But sometimes, and finally, sometimes joy is ushered in when the presence of God shows up. When the presence of God shows up. Oh my. You know, the Quakers uh, practiced something in their worship called quietism. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we, as a, as a congregation, uh, adopt quietism as part of our worship. I don't think we could. <laughs> because in quietism, the premise is that you come in to worship, you sit down, because he preached my sermon from the piano. <laughs> but we clutter up our lives so badly with so much stuff. And all we really need is the presence of God to come in. And oftentimes when he comes, he brings joy with it. The joy of his presence. Listen to what the psalmist said in Psalm 16. He says, I will bless the Lord who guides me, even at night my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad, and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life. 
granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Oh, listen, when I had those dark nights of the soul, many of those times, the solution came when the Lord showed up. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, I don't have to worry. I don't have to have my mind battling and, and, and going on and on and over and over. Lord, I just trust you. Lord, you're, you're, you're with me. You're in me. You grant me the joy of your presence. But there's another part of this presence. And I want to close with this because it's I, I uh, almost called Randy uh, earlier in the week, and I guess I could have. But I know this church probably knows uh, Dennis Jernigan's When the Night is Falling. Is that a yes? Yes. yes. And it, it's based on Zephaniah 3.17. Listen to Zephaniah 3.17. It says, For the Lord your God is living among you. He's a mighty Savior. He will delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. Oh, man. The presence of God shows up. And he grabs us up. And he holds us close. And he sings us a lullaby of joy. I, I, I love it when that happens. And in the course of that song it, it, that, that Dennis Jernigan wrote, it, it's just the Lord saying to us, Child, I love you, child, I love you. How I love you, child, I love you. How I love you. It's just a beautiful little chorus. And I'm here to tell you what is available to every single one of us in this room this morning is the joy of the Lord. Sometimes you're not in it. You're having to wait for it. While you're waiting, you may weep, but it's only going to last for a little while. When it comes, it may have to come as a proclamation, as a decree of faith. You may just have to start praising even when you don't want to. Oh, but when he comes. When the joy of the Lord is. When the presence of God comes. Oh, the joy comes flooding. The joy of the Lord is. In your presence is fullness of joy. God, this morning, meet us at this altar. Some of us need to come into partnership with you. You've made an amazing offer to every one of us. You've offered us your plenty for our lack. You've offered us your peace for our chaos. You, you've offered us great wisdom and understanding for our inability to, uh, to deal with things. Lord, I'm reminded that in that intertestamental period, as Israel was suffering through those six different governmental uh, transitions, Lord, that they were awaiting the one whom it was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, and upon him shall rest the government. Lord, this morning we need the government of Jesus to govern our lives. Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory and the honor as we cry out to you, as we come to you this morning. Meet us, I pray, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Set us free this morning. Let us lay our burdens down and let us come to this altar and let you sing over us how much you love us. We'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.
You come as the Holy Spirit leads you to come. Our prayer teams are here. They'll wait on you. They'll pray for you. You come as Randy leads us in. As we just wait on the Lord this morning. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. Ungird up my legs that I might stand in this hole.
part of your daily walk? Is joy part of who you are? It, it can be. And I'm just always amazed somehow that uh, you and I have this wonderful opportunity available to us, partnering with the Lord, and we uh, and we don't. We end up kind of leaving it on the table, if you will. Oh, but it's available. The, the Holy Spirit can generate that fruit in your life and in my life. So I, I don't know. I think it's kind of a good deal to sell. I think it's a, a wonderful thing the Lord has offered to us. And uh, I think it's a great thing that he's offered to us eternal life. You know, eternal life comes when we trust Jesus Christ alone to save us. Not church membership, not mom and dad's faith. Your faith personally in Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's how God has determined that he would offer this gift of salvation. And it's because... Jesus' blood shed at the cross. That blood paid the penalty for your sins and mine. And so this morning, the Lord invites all to come and receive. And eternal life, eternal life is not just something that starts when we die and we live forever. No, eternal life starts at the moment we trust the one who is eternal life. And that eternal life starts now. It starts when we trust Him. And we're given that gift. Yeah, we'll live forever. But we'll live forever with that supernatural quality of life that can be experienced both now and forever. What a great offer. So won't you come this morning? Trust Christ. Any of our prayer team would love to help you to know Jesus if you don't know Jesus this morning.
yourselves to the inside or outside of the bulletins and announcements so I'm going to remember this time because it's in front of me last week it's in front of me this week but the man of Altar's Gate <laughs> and Sam's here today so he didn't hear me mess up last week anyway so the men of Altar's Gate uh, please join them on uh, December the 17th for uh, the men's breakfast from 8 a.m. until uh, 10 a.m. in the cafe and for more information Contact Sam Barone, him and his lovely bride are here this morning. So that's coming up next Saturday. So be there, be there. Come sample their cooking and let me know what it tastes like. I wouldn't know, but anyway, but, but be there, okay. Uh, Christmas Eve, praise the Lord. Bring the whole family, and we mean it, for a beautiful time of worship through scriptures, prayer, scripture, prayer, carols, and candlelight at 4 p.m. And, and communion. So bring the entire family. I forgot. I, I, I was gonna, this is a warning. <laughs> Pastor Regina and I was supposed to surprise. Okay. On 
Christmas Eve, we're going to wear our robes. We're going to wear our robes. Now, let me tell you what. Let me tell you what. It'll be the last time that we'll be able to wear them. Because the United Methodist robe, and we're not going to wear them after the 31st. God. So pr I pray God blessings. I pray peace. I pray prosperity, Father. Most important of all, Father, if anybody doesn't know you, Lord, Father God, keep pursuing them until they surrender. God, I thank you and I praise you. I pray blessings upon your people. It's in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord. 